this episode, see like Christian Münzner. Hey Guitar Champion, what's going on? Justin Hombach here and welcome to another episode of the Shred ABC. The format where I'm going to show you all those underground shred guitar players which are really worth to check out. Okay, and today we have a really special episode. Well, it will be two episodes, to be honest. Because I have a huge guest here on the Shred ABC, Christian Münzner himself. If you don't know who Christian Münzner is, Christian has played for the two most influential technical death metal bands. One is Obscura and the other one is Necrophages. And with the Necrophages he even started this genre and this a scene of technical death metal. He's a really phenomenal shred guitar player, a phenomenal musician who has inspired a lot of players worldwide. He has released tons of records as a guest artist, as a band member or as a solo artist on his solo records. And yeah, on today he is the guest on my show. I have a big, really a big interview with Christian. The interview is like 50 minutes long and I know this can be a lot in the beginning, but I highly recommend everybody grab yourself a cup of coffee or a beer or even something nice to eat and watch the complete interview. Christian had so much interesting stuff to say about being a musician and music itself and guitar playing and it's really a really interesting, mind-blowing and a really great interview. It was a lot of fun to do this. Christian is such a humble and nice and a funny person. This was a really great day at his home studio. We have talked about his music career, his life, his history in general, all the influences, his focal dystonia, the sickness where Christian really have to fight with and has to change his style a little bit, uh, some really interesting details on that, his sound, his gear and how he thinks as a musician, as a solo artist or as a guitarist. It's really interesting to get into the mind of Christian Münzner. In the comments I will put a timestamp where you can check out every section of this video if you are more interested in the gear or if you want to rewatch the influences from Christian. Um, so you have a kind of fast travel to this kind of section. Usually I do a lick for the artist, a lick in the style of the artist here on the Shred ABC format, but I'm going to do this next week in the next video. This will be a little bit too long now. Here is just only the interview. Next week there will be an awesome link in the style of Christian Münzner, so go ahead and check that out as well. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments. I will answer them and maybe Christian as well will answer them too. And without further ado, let me introduce to you now Christian Münzner. Have fun with the interview. Cheers. Christian, hello, glad to be here. Thanks for having me here for my uh, Shred ABC show. Um, today, on today's episode, it will be all about you, mm -hmm. your style, your playing, your artistic thinking, and mm -hmm. your history. Mm -hmm. and the history is the point where I want to start with. Um, I think for many people, you are known through your face in Necrophages. Yes. Um, because I think it's the first time you've been on the map, really. Mm -hmm. But what was before Necrophages, for that time? Tell me a little bit about the Christian okay. before Necrophages. Yeah, well, I started playing guitar when I was 11 years old. Mm -hmm. So that is, uh, now I have to calculate. It's about uh, 25, 26 years ago now. Mm -hmm. yeah, six years ago cool. now. And um, I started out playing just for fun. I wanted to play rock stuff. I got an Epiphone SG mm -hmm. for my, um, I think it was uh, for my birthday, for my 11th birthday, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, first I just started playing riffs. I got ACDC tablature books. I wanted to play stuff like that. Cool. Just for myself. And I, I wasn't really interested in, in playing solos or something. And then mm -hmm. there was a, um, at a school I went to, there was a band and a school band and the guitar player. He, he was quite good for the time and he mm -hmm. played some, some pentatonic blues solos and stuff, and I was like, wow, that's cool, I don't know how to do that. And then that guy started giving lessons, mm -hmm. and I started taking some private lessons with him. And this is when I started how to learn how to play solos, and he then introduced me to the more technical players. Yes. Like um, Ingo Malmsteen and Dream Theater, they were a whole new world for me when I was like 13, 14 years old. Then he took me to see Paul Gilbert in a guitar clinic in 95. Cool. And then I started playing in that school band, mm -hmm. and I got a little bit better, and then after seeing Paul Gilbert, I got really 
into practicing. That's when mm -hmm. I really started to have a period where I was very obsessed with practicing several hours a day, up to eight hours a day. Oh, really? After cool. school for, for a period of time I did that. And um, I played in small hometown bands basically, but they never went anywhere beyond uh, mm -hmm. my hometown. Uh, I always actually wanted to make a power metal band, a progressive metal band when I got into Dream Theater, Symphony X, Ingui, that stuff. The, all the stuff that, that I discovered while I developed my playing skills. Mm -hmm. And then there was a, a band in um, a, a town close to where I lived. Mm -hmm. They were called Defeated Sanity and they made an announcement in a newspaper in 1999, or 20 years ago now. And they were looking for lead guitar player and mm -hmm. they wrote technical death metal. And I didn't know much about death metal, but I mean, it, they said it's technical progressive music and I was like, hmm, I can't really find a band here I want to play with. So I basically went to the audition mm -hmm. and uh, they really liked my playing and I really liked their discipline and their, their approach to music. And then I started playing in that band and uh, for, for a year, two years, we rehearsed every Saturday. We rehearsed from one in the afternoon until like nine, ten o'clock in the evening. Mm -hmm. And I got really good in that time also playing with a band, playing all that stuff at very high tempos, odd meters, mm -hmm. all, all, all that stuff. And then that's how I learned to know death metal. Yeah, really I mean, cool. yeah, we, we were then, they had a demo before my time. It was on a sampler with Necrophages, the band called Necrophages, right? Mm -hmm. And it was this, uh, a demo version of Fall by the Autopsy. And I heard it for the first time. And for me, coming from that more Ingo Malmsteen, Paul Gilbert kind of background. Mm -hmm. And then in Death Metal where I appreciate the rhythm work, but you always had those chaotic Slayer style solos, which mm -hmm. wasn't really my thing, which I learned to accept, but which wasn't really my thing. And then I suddenly heard a band that combined the two things. And I was like, man, if, if Death Metal was like that, mm -hmm. uh, I think I would actually like it even more, you know? And then uh, what happened next? In 2001, after I graduated from, from school, I went to the MGI, the Munich Guitar Institute. Mm -hmm. I did like a one-year course there. Mm -hmm. um, I had left the Vita by that time because I wanted to focus a little bit on, on different things. And then uh, one day Lille, uh, the drummer of the Vita gave me a call and he said, hey, have you heard uh, Necrophages, the guitar player, just left the band? Mm -hmm. And I know you, you really like that band, so maybe you should give it a try. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's really cool because if he hadn't done that, I would never have thought about uh, contacting Mohammed. And I had the first edition of the first album where his email address yes. was written in there. So what happened was uh, I sent him an email, right? I said, hey, mm -hmm. I heard your guitar player left. And then I introduced myself a little bit. I said, hey, I have this kind of uh, shred background a little bit, mm -hmm. but also the death metal background and I'm doing the MGI. And then he invited me for an audition. I learned two songs. I think it was uh, Fall by the Autopsy yes. and To Breathe in a Casket. Mm -hmm. We, we went to the rehearsal room and played the songs with real amps, you know, the, the, the way things were like 18 years ago. It's 18 years ago now, yeah, crazy. Or 17 years ago, yeah, 17 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and then I started playing with that band. Then Epitaph was released and this is from probably because that album had such an impact. Mm -hmm. um, this is how my career started to, yes. to, to take shape, I guess. Really? Yeah. Great, great. And that was also the time where you've met your long time uh, drummer buddy Hannes the first time, or did you met him? Oh, well, Hannes I actually met a little bit earlier. A little bit earlier? Yes, and that was during the time I was uh, at the MGI, and it was actually really funny. The, the, the way I met Hannes was I played for a short time in a, in a local thrash metal band okay. called Hatred. Ah. And we played a show with um, Tom Angel River from Sodom. Ah, really cool. In, it was around Christmas 2001, a little bit before Christmas 2001. Mm -hmm. And Hannes was playing there with his band Devil's Cry, mm -hmm. and he had a backpack. And on his backpack there was a Dream Theater patch. Oh, cool. And I saw him backstage with the Dream Theater patch. And I was like, I think this guy is cool, it's a Dream Theater patch. So we <laughs> talked to this guy, right? Yeah. And I was like, hey, cool Dream Theater patch. Mm -hmm. And he's like, thank you, thank you. And then we were like starting to talk, what bands do you listen to? Yeah. And then he started mentioning like Mike Stern. I was like, wow, I go to a local metal show and someone knows Mike Stern, oh, yeah, right? Cool. And then we started to talk about that stuff, Mike Stern and Symphony X. And then I was, oh, but we also like Marvin Angel, you know, we know this, wow. Mm -hmm. And, we, and then we started, we went from talking about dissection to talking to about Ali Meola, you know? yes. and that was, that was super cool because it was pre-internet days, basically, mm -hmm. already, and then it was more obscure. You didn't have contacts like today where you could share your mm -hmm. influences and interests with. So uh, th that was a really cool experience. Uh, and then we hadn't crossed paths anymore, and I started playing in Necrophages, mm -hmm. and then the drummer who was in Necro by that time, he quit. Ah. And we're looking for a new drummer. And I was like, man, I, 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 I remember this guy. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know his name anymore, right? oh, really? but I remember this guy that I met back then. And then by accident I met him again at a, at a Cryptopsy show mm -hmm. in 2002. 
and then I, I just joined Necrophages, and then I got his name, mm -hmm. and then I was talking uh, about it with Muhammad, I was like, let's get this guy a try, right? And then I sent him an email. Yes. And that's how Hannes actually got into, into Necrophages. Necrophages. Yes, oh, really? and that's how I started playing with Necrophages, and then the rest that was just history, how the rest um, developed yeah. then. Yeah. Nice, great, great, yeah. didn't knew that, wow. Yeah. Um, and you released Epitaph in 2004? 2004, recorded 2003, released mm -hmm. it in 2004, yes. Mm -hmm. But in the same year, a year you um, started leaving um, Necrophages? No, no. I actually I left Necrophages in 2006. I still played one tour with them. Ah, okay. The very first European tour they did was with um, Boltrower and Levant Creation. I still played that tour. Mm -hmm. And after this tour, it was, was basically when I quit. Yeah. Ah, yeah. but during the time from, um, I would say, Epitaph to the next big thing, with mm -hmm. the, with the, which is obviously Obscura. Yes. Um, it seems like from your biography that you are kind of a touring guitar player yeah. around that time. Yes. Played in a lot of bands. Yes. The, what, what I did around that time, it was it's quite interesting. I was still at university. I, mm -hmm. I started something not music related. Mm -hmm. And when the split came with Necrophages, I thought, okay, I'm um, I'm going to focus on my studies first. You mm -hmm. know, finish this. Wasn't even sure anymore at that point if I wanted to take, turn music into a career or not. So yeah. It was a little bit. Was it not not so much of a good time? And I was a little bit undecided. Mm -hmm. And then um, a good friend of mine, he played guitar in a band called Majesty, which mm -hmm. later became Metal Force, and yes. they were looking for a guitar player. And I still wanted to play, I didn't just want, not want to play shows anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, that's why I joined that band mm -hmm. for a while. And we played a couple of shows which were really cool, we played with Manowar, mm -hmm. oh, Magic really? Circle Festival cool. two awesome. times, which, and one gig was in front of 20,000 people, 22,000 people. Still to this day, the biggest show that mm -hmm. I ever played, and it was it was a good time. It was a heavy metal band. They had a bit of the heavy metal lifestyle. Mm -hmm. It was fun, you know. It was, was a really good time. The music was quite simple, easy to play, and mm -hmm. was was actually a really good times. So I did this while doing my studies at the mm -hmm. same time, but it wasn't as demanding as Necrophagist. Mm -hmm. And um, then after what Hannes, I heard he had quit Necrophagist too. We started to get in touch again. And um, we both then joined Obscura in early 2008. Early 2008. I think, yes. I had a couple of other things going on as well. I wanted to, I played in a band called Civilization 1 for a short time mm -hmm. with the singer from Firewind, but it didn't really go anywhere. Mm -hmm. A couple of things that I tried to do on my own, but it, it wasn't ready yet. So it wasn't by purpose that you tried to be a, like a touring guitar not player? Not really, no, not really. It was, it was really like sometimes in life it happens, you get a chance and you, mm -hmm. you kind of got to take it and it takes you to the next thing. I mean, yes. most of the things from my experience, they happen by chance. I mean, if I hadn't joined Defeated Sanity, I wouldn't have ended up playing for Necrophagist. True, true. Right? And, 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 and everything that you do, everything that you do in your life, all the steps that you take, down the road it, it, it leads to something else, you know. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the way it, it, it went from my experience. And I, I often... I mean, I don't want to say I don't, I don't have a direction of what I want to do, but often I went with the flow, you know, because you never know what, what's happening next. I know I want to right. make music, right. and then Majesty, okay, it wasn't 100% my music, but I still wanted to play, I got to play good shows. Yes. It wasn't that I hated the music, I could still play cool solo, it was mm -hmm. very metal, you know, I had a connection with the music. Yes. So I definitely, definitely, every, I think there's nothing in my in my history as a musician that I regret doing. Oh really? Yeah. Great. And in 2008 you've joined Obscura? Yes. Tell us a little bit more about this, how this happened. Yeah, the whole it's, story. A, it's another long story, um, because uh, the way I met them was Suffocation. Mm -hmm. We were on a European tour in 2006. Okay. And one of the guitar players, Terence Hobbs, couldn't do the tour, mm -hmm. uh, because he had a, some problems with the passport. And I was friends with Marcus Lemsch, the old guitar player, who played before me. And uh, he gave me a call and said, um, suffocation, they're coming mm -hmm. with only one guitar and looking for a second guitar player, can, can you do it? And I was like, man, the tour starts tomorrow in two days, I, I, I don't think I can do that, you know, they have 25 riffs per song, and it's really hard to play, I, I don't think it will work. But yeah, well, maybe you can just come, say hello and give it a try. Mm -hmm. So I actually went to one of the places one day before the first show took place, I don't remember which city it was. Um, and I met the guys in suffocation, I chanted a little bit with the guitar player then, uh, Gaia was his name. But I was like, dude, this is this is too much, you know. If I if I play with you tomorrow, it sounds worse than if you mm -hmm. play as a four piece. But the thing is, Obscura were opening act on the tour, and this mm -hmm. is how I met Stefan. Mm -hmm. And then um, after a while, Stefan had already asked me in two thousand seven if I wanted to join Obscura. Okay. But I was playing Majesty. I was I wanted to finish my studies, you know, and I, I so I turned him down. I was like, no, it's not really what I want to do at this mm -hmm. point. But then later on, Jeroen uh, Tesseling and Hanna had also joined the band. Mm -hmm. and then I was like, damn. Should have joined back there, you know, because this is a really cool lineup. Okay. 
And then uh, Stefan wrote me again. I was like, hey, I have a guitar player, he can't do it. Are you, are you, I know you asked you again, but I'm asking a second time, mm -hmm. would you still be in, or would you be interested in playing with us? And I was like, yeah, cool. I mean, th those guys also joined, and I think this band could go somewhere, right? And yes. then, and then actually the first time we ever met together was a photo shoot. Mm -hmm. um, we did the promo photos for 40 Cosmo Channels record, and we did a three track promo track, which is uh, EP, yes, which basically had. Um, demo versions of Anti-Cosmic Overload, Incarnated mm -hmm. and Choir of Spirits and this we sent to the labels mm -hmm. and I still had the contact of Gordon Conrad from Relapse Records when I did interviews for Necrophagist, I had collaborated with him and I sent him the demo and then we got signed to Relapse and then this is how oh, cool. this band cool. basically started taking off, yeah. Okay, and in Obscura you had um, a little bit more freedom yes. to uh, write your uh, songs, yes. to even write yes. wrote one song or a few songs entirely, yes, like yes. Universal Momentum. Yes, Universal Momentum was entirely my song. Yes. It's a song I had written for Necrophagist when I was a Necrophagist, mm. but Muhammad didn't really like it. But I was always convinced of this song. And yes. guys was going, hey, it's a really cool song, let's, let's use it. It had mm. this kind of Necrophagist thing, but with more neoclassical progressions going on. And I also could write my own progressions for the solos that I would play over. Cool. And, um, Solo parts were more open, you know, they allowed me to experiment with a little bit more different mm -hmm. influences where the necrophagy stuff was mainly a, a friction dominant soloing. Mm -hmm. And I had a little bit more freedom in that regard. And this was when I started exploring more my, my side as a writer. Cool. Well. Yeah. cool. And you've released two records with Obscura? Yes. Um, Anti Cosmic Overlord in 2000. Cosmo Genesis. Uh, Cosmo Genesis. Yes. So yeah. In 2009 and on yeah. Nivium in 2011. Yes, exactly. Um, Tell us more about the transition from Cosmogenesis to Omnivium. Yeah. Is there a different approach to yeah. songwriting? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the Cosmogenesis was a very spontaneous record. You know, mm -hmm. we, we, we got together and we didn't have big plans with the band. We were like, hey, everyone has a couple of songs written. It was actually a very rock and roll attitude to, mm -hmm. to, the, to the music making. You know, the whole, whole album was written in a couple of uh, months. You know, everyone brought all songs and then we just, let's just make a record. Let's just see where it goes. You know, let's not overthink mm -hmm. things. And Omnivium was different because the band already existed, we had played tours together, we had uh, started having a vision, we started writing a lot of stuff while we were on tour, mm -hmm. on the laptops in Guitar Pro, you know, and the album really went over the top, it's really monstered out in all directions, mm -hmm. you know, it's um, very long songs, very layered, very uh, extremely uh, layered stuff, ex complicated arrangements. Um, it was a lot harder actually to, to record it. the songs were a lot harder to, to play live. I think it's, a, it's much darker. I think also the record is a little bit more difficult to listen to. It's mm -hmm. more um, intense, you know, it's, mm -hmm. there's, there's so much stuff going on at the same time. And um, retrospective, I probably think that I even enjoyed the, the more spontaneous approach on Cosmo okay. Genesis a little bit more from my head, even though on a new I had more input. I mean, mm -hmm. there's m a lot more of my riffs on there. Mm -hmm. Even though I didn't write an, a complete song, but um, like uh, the opening track and the title track and the instrumental, like a lot of the riffs are actually mine. Okay, cool. It's just uh, there's some stuff from Hannes and Stefan, and then Hannes put it into arrangements and stuff. Yes. And so there's a lot of input, especially those three songs. Mm -hmm. So I really connect a little bit with that album. But but for some reason, uh, I enjoyed it more in the Cosmo Genesis days. Cool, yeah. cool. Then you switched from your guitar from 16 to 7 string, Yes, right? but it wasn't my idea. It was okay. the idea of Stefan and mm -hmm. yeah, To get that use. more darker yeah. sound, yes. more brutal sound. Exactly. exactly. Cool, cool. And during your time with um, Obscura, mm -hmm. you also wrote some solo records yes. too. Exactly. It was the same time where I started uh, starting... It, was, it started out more as a fun project, mm -hmm. you know. I started doing instrumental solo records. It was something I always wanted to do. I never knew if I could do it because it's actually very difficult to keep the attention of the mm -hmm. listener with just instrumental guitar stuff. And what happened was I had some ideas, you know, that I had collected for many years since mm -hmm. since my teenage years, since '96. I had really mm -hmm. many, many, many ideas. And we recorded Omnivium. I recorded my solos for the album at home. And in the process, I th I had started having ideas, you know, for instrumental stuff. And I was like, hmm, maybe I should just try you know, write an instrumental tune just yes. for fun. While I still recorded the, um, the solos for Olivia, and I wrote an instrumental tune in one day, I was like, wow, this, this <laughs> actually turned out really good. Okay. You know? And I have a lot of freedom, you know, and I started got, got more experience with home recording. And then exactly the moment that I finished my solos for Olivia, I said, okay, now I'm going to do a solo record. It was a very, very spontaneous idea. Cool. And then I composed the entire record within three months only. Oh, really? Yes. And then it took another three months mm -hmm. to record it. Mm -hmm. So what happened was the idea for the solo record started in maybe September 2010 mm -hmm. and I released the album in April 2011. 
and I was like, wow, you know, it was really just for fun, but it, many people actually really liked it, you know, just saw another side of my playing, of my mm -hmm. writing style that I couldn't really do in the death metal context. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is then also why I, why I then, you know, a couple years later did the second one. It was more, uh, more to, to enjoying the freedom, you know, mm -hmm. to do whatever I want without having to restrict myself in terms of style and genre. And and those two records were really one hundred percent me, mm -hmm. and um, and that was a that was a very nice experience. It was a very important experience for me as a musician, mm -hmm. you know, to develop my own trademark style and sound a little bit further. Was there a different approach from Time Lapse, which was your first yeah. uh, solo record, yeah. to uh, Beyond the Walls of Sleep? Yes. Yes. So it's the yeah. second solo record. Was yes. there a different approach? To Definitely. It? I mean, that the first one was more I do everything that comes to mind. I, every mm -hmm. every old song I do. It's a more uplifting sounding record. Very happy sounding record. There's mm -hmm. a lot of power metal influence in there. Rock influences. You know, fusion influences. Even mm -hmm. a little of the um, some melodic death metal influences. But it's very uplifting but very spontaneous you know very different genres between the songs mm -hmm. um, on the second solo album I wanted to be more actually the first half of it is where I'm, I'm, it's more about the riff you know mm -hmm. I want to be I had a lot of influences from technical thrash metal bands I wanted to really instrumental tunes are really riff focused mm -hmm. that's what I'm doing in the first half of the second album that's why there's a darker theme to it the music sounds a little bit darker it's not as heavily layered and orchestrated as the first one mm -hmm. you know and um, the second half of the album is actually a direct tribute more to my 80s treadmill influences. You know, there's some mini cool. more tonic alpine mm -hmm. influences on there where I really, really on purpose tried to write something cool. in that style. So in, 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 in essence, you can think of the second solo record as maybe two EPs. You know, ah. if I had to release it as two EPs, people would probably understand the, the um, intention a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, it was released as an album back then, and that's cool. But that's what the second one is about. Okay, cool. Yeah. And both CDs are still available on Bandcamp? Or well, yeah, the Time Hop CD just sold out. Oh. So I'm, I'm not so. just thinking if I do a repress or if, I just, mm -hmm. if it's just available digitally. Okay. But there's going to be a tap book released for Time Hop. Oh, cool. cool. I just finished it last week. Mm -hmm. uh, probably going to release it a little bit later this month. Cool, nice. Yeah. Nice. And during that time with your solo records and Obscura, mm -hmm. you also have been in two different yes. bands. Yes. Spawn of, Spawn yeah. of Possession and mm -hmm. uh, Paradox. Mm -hmm. no Spawn of Possession, uh, I think uh, most fans you know of Skurra know Spawn of Possession. Mm -hmm. Technical death metal band, definitely probably my favorite band in that genre. Besides, oh, really? I mean, of course, uh, in the past I was a Macrophages fan, but from the bands that appeared later, I really, really, really liked the Templeland record. Mm -hmm. And um, then when, when Jonas, you know, was looking for a lead guitar player and I, I wrote him, hey, I really like your band. He listened to a couple of my solos in Obscura and he said, hey, Really like a style you want to do all the solos on the record, mm -hmm. and I was like, yeah, cool. I would really like to do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm featured officially on that record as a band member. Mm -hmm. But all I ever did in reality was I just played the solos for okay. the album. You know, mm -hmm. Everything else is Jonas. He wrote all the songs, recorded all the rhythms. Mm -hmm. um, he actually is a good solo player, but he wasn't comfortable with it. You know, mm -hmm. he was like, hey, man, I like a style. Can you can you do it? You know, so I recorded the solos for that. I'm really happy with it because it's a very different approach to what I do when I did Nobscura on my solo records because I had to play a very um, interesting sounding riffs, you know, more chrom more chromatic approach to the writing. I had to think mm -hmm. very differently in terms of what note scale material I use. Mm -hmm. So which actually I grew a lot as a musician. Mm -hmm. And the other band was Paradox. They're more or less from my home area. It's also another band I was a big fan of. They started in the 80s. They had two records in the 80s. It's technical thrash metal, a cool. genre I'm really, really, I'm really into as a fan. And I always wanted to play for that band, you know. Mm -hmm. And then um, a friend of mine played drums for them. He was like, hey, you want to play? Guitar was not, I was like, was like, yeah, you know, because I liked the band so much. And yeah, we did the album Tales of the Weird. And I really like it because it's kind of it's, it's kind of a mixture between power metal mm -hmm. and technical thrash metal. You know, it mm -hmm. sounds like if you cross 90s era Blank Alien with Forbidden, you know, and I, I'm really, really, really proud of that record, even though not many people know about it, but it's mm -hmm. actually one of my uh, favorite records I ever played on. Cool. Yeah. So in 2014 you quit mm -hmm. um, Obscura because of your focal dystonia, yes. which we're going to talk a little bit more later yeah. on about this. Yeah. Um, but then you've joined mm -hmm. um, um, Alkaloid? Yeah. Or did you? Well, I was basically the idea was um, I was there from the beginning more or mm -hmm. less. Okay. I mean, probably the guys had the idea maybe uh, three weeks before they asked me, you mm -hmm. know, if I also want to join. But they said, "Hey, I mean, we would like a style." But in gen in a sense, the, the, the moment the band became popular, yes. I, I was a member, so mm -hmm. I, I consider myself a founding member mm -hmm. of Alkaloid. Yeah, definitely. And there you are again with Hannes Grossman. Yes. And two other guitar players. Yes. So uh, there we have the situation of three guitar yes, players. Yes, exactly. Tell us a little bit more about this, the approach of three guitar yes. players. That was interesting for us as well, because we didn't know before how mm -hmm. this is going to work out, you know, um, with, with three guitar players. And I mean, everyone plays a very, 
different style, mm-hmm. you know, very, yes. um, very individual styles. I think we have three very different individual styles. And um, really, I think what I really like about that approach is we really, the strengths and weaknesses everyone has, I think it gives a really, really, really good combination. It mm-hmm. really only works in that combination. And, and, and Morian is also doing the, the vocals. Yes. And he's an amazing guitar player and he does a lot of crazy acoustic guitar stuff, the flamenco mm-hmm. stuff. It's a very individual approach to the, to the metal guitar stuff as well. But he's not playing on all the tunes mm-hmm. because sometimes in the mix we noticed, you know, how to mix three guitars in a, in a, in a stereo mix. It's actually not so easy. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we, we were thinking we have two guitars left, right, maybe have one guitar mm-hmm. in the middle. Yes. But it was very, very tricky also to arrange it, especially, you know, with the high gain sound that we play for, for the death metal stuff. It, 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 it was tricky. And some, so it's, it's, it's arranged in a way. And some stuff, it, some sections really work with three guitars. Mm-hmm. Others, we only play with two guitars and mm-hmm. it only focuses on the vocals. And the slower stuff, usually, I mean, some stuff like Cthulhu, we really play with three guitars live, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, it comes really, really heavy, really yes. intense. Other stuff like all the magnitudes, which is a little bit more, um, uh, which is a little bit more, how do you say, uh, technical, you know, mm-hmm. three guitars would just be too much. Mm. And we and we, we we don't really do it like that, but we have a lot of options with it. Yes, you know, and 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 and, and what everyone has to do, we all have to take our egos back a little bit, mm-hmm. because if everyone wants to be focused one hundred percent of the time, it it doesn't really work. Right? Mm-hmm. But um, I think there's a lot of advantages to that approach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the third guitarist is Danny Tucker. Right? Tucker, Tucker, yeah. Tucker, yeah. Tucker. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Linus Clausewitz yeah. on bass, which yeah. is also the successor of John Tesselin. In Florida, yes, correct. Exactly. Yes, right. Exactly. Okay. You released uh, two records so far with yes, um, exactly. Alkaloid. Yes. So in, in Alkaloid, you are pushing the boundaries for this progressive, more like technical death yeah. metal kind of, but really atmospheric. Yeah. But on the other hand, you have formed mm-hmm. a new band, yes. Eternity's yes. End, which yes. is more like your. This is yeah. This is my baby, basically. Yes. Right. Eternity's End is my own band mm-hmm. that I started. This is this is that thing that I wanted to do since you know twenty years, more than twenty years. It's. it's very different from alcohol, it's probably mm-hmm. the opposite of alcohol, yeah. you know? uh, in, in a way, I mean, yeah, you know, but um, it, it, it's, re- it's really my, my own thing, like, I always wanted to do a band like that, I always wanted to be in a power metal band, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, I would have been happy being just a member of a cool power metal band, but it was my dream to form my own power metal band, you mm-hmm. know, and a um, friend of mine one day, he said, hey, man, no, just talk about it, just do it, you know, why don't you just do it, and that kind of stuck with me, you know, and yes. then when I left Obscura, and I was like, now I have more time to do what I really want to do, um, then that's when I started Eternity's End. And cool. That, that's, that's basically the realization of uh, my dream for 20 years. And I always want to do something with clean vocals. Mm-hmm. I always like that neoclassical stuff. I mean, I love keyboards, you know, and all the stuff that I incorporate in the band. Mm-hmm. Like be quiet, I like working like that. And, um, and and I'm actually very happy I finally yes. did that in my own band. And there's also a really interesting lineup in this band mm-hmm. with Jimmy Pitts on keys yes. and Mike LePont on yes. uh, bass, yes. Yes. Hannes Grossman again on drums, yeah, always, always, always yes. the Gross, yeah, yeah. Um, and a new guitar player for the yes. second record, yes. Phil. Yes. yes, I think that's the biggest change we have from the mm-hmm. first record. And um, you know, this is the thing. I mean, often in, in, in I mean, I've always been in two guitarist situations. Mm-hmm. The songs for Eternity and have always been written for two guitars. But I wanted in the beginning when I did the first album. Um, I have many friends of mine, you know, could theoretically play the stuff. I have many mm-hmm. uh, friends who are good guitar players who could play it. But I was like, I want someone in, in that band, you know, I can who, who completely shares my vision. Mm-hmm. So I mean, Phil is an amazing guitar player. He's a very individual style that I really, really like. And most importantly, he's a really, really good writer. You mm-hmm. know, and and he's um, he's the first person I ever met who who completely gets in my vision, right? Mm-hmm. Like he's it's a completely same vision that we have, and that's why the. The, and then we really co-wrote the, the new album, mm-hmm. uh, 50-50 basically, and it worked so well. I mean, the exchange of ideas, it was so refreshing, we could easily have written like two records in a row, right? Yeah. And that's why I'm... And, and actually, I really have to admit the band became better because of that, you know? And because sometimes he wrote something and my ideas were the missing link and his ideas sometimes was the opposite. Mm-hmm. And I had a song, I was like, man, I can't continue this, don't know how to continue. He sent me some riff banks and I was like, wow, this is exactly mm-hmm. what has to go there, you know? And it's a very... Um, I, I mean, for me, the melodies are always very important. He has a very sensitive ear for melodies, mm-hmm. and we came up. And, and this was really one of those rare occasions where you write as a team, and it becomes so much better than what, what each one could achieve on his own. Mm-hmm. Right? So I'm really, really happy we took that step. And then, what, of course, what we also did was, I've always a huge fan of uh, Razor X and Pacophony, yes. you know, mm-hmm. the, the twin guitar soloing stuff. And I always want to do something. Like mm-hmm. that, you know, not many bands do it like that anymore nowadays. I mean, often you have two good guitar players, but now. 
they both do their thing. Yes. Uh, and and I always really liked that. You know, I mean, I, when I watched those old Razer X videos, I was like, man, this was, would be so cool. I would yes. do something like that, even though it's very, you know, it's, it's a very high goal, you know, very high mm -hmm. standard to set. But then we totally went for that on the new record. Cool, you know? yes. we, we, it's all over the album. Like every song is harmonized solos. Yes. And, and they're really difficult, I must say. It's, it's really, I mean, people say, oh, now we do something more straightforward. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, this is some of the hardest stuff, I guess, I have ever recorded. Oh, really? No, cool. yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Any plans to play some live shows, or live gigs with Eternity End? That's definitely the, the, the biggest plan right mm -hmm. now. Right? I mean, because people, they think, well, it's a, it's a project, you know, because you have a singer from Brazil, you have two guys from America, two mm -hmm. guys from Germany, one guy from Canada. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not a band, it's a project. But um, actually, the way we wrote the album, you know, there was a band chemistry, you know, the exchange of ideas, we got excited as we would get, as, you know, it just, Feeling when you're 14, you have your first band, and and you have big, big, you know, big visions, and everyone is is totally into it. And this is kind of the way it felt this time, mm -hmm. even though it happened online, you know. But but we are a band, you know? yes. And, and that's why we have to play live because once we took that first step, this is when um, people will actually know, okay, this is a real band, and we get out of that stigma of being a, mm -hmm. an internet project, and we we are more than that, you know. And it's a little bit of a, a challenge logistically, financially, yes. Yes. definitely. So now we're kind of brainstorm how can we do mm -hmm. that but I mean I always think if there's a will there's a way and, yes. and definitely the latest in 2020 we definitely will play like awesome, awesome. Yeah. great, great. Yeah. so and you wrote all the lyrics for the record for the first record or how did the approach yeah on the, on the first record I wrote all the lyrics myself mm -hmm. where I composed the whole entire album mm -hmm. including the lyrics and the vocal melodies except for one song where our former singer Ian Perry wrote the lyrics, a song called White Lies all the other lyrics were mine mm -hmm. on the second album we started sharing the lyrics um, I wrote a couple of lyrics, uh, Yuri wrote uh, one song and then, um, but after like, there were like two or three songs with lyrics, um, Phil was like, man, all of that stuff, you know, it fits really well into a concept he would be thinking of mm -hmm. because we like concept power metal records, stuff mm -hmm. like a hypertrace by Scanner or the Find the Rules by Hebria and all that kind of stuff, Unification by Aaron Savior, the, uh, you know, albums which have kind of a science mm -hmm. fiction concept and then Phil started to develop this insane concept that you could write actual novel about it, or yes. a serious novel, right? really? because it's, he developed this entire big world yes. and, and, and all those characters, you know, and, and I was like, wow, holy fuck, man, how did you do that, you know? <laughs> no, I was just thinking about it, you know? And then I was like, man, this, this is so good. And then he was so fast, you know, with writing lyrics, he did, it all started to happen in his mind. And then he wrote the lyrics for, I think, 70% um, of the songs. Mm -hmm. And two are mine, one is yours, you know, mm -hmm. we made a couple of changes here and there. But um, he had the entire concept in his mind, cool. you know, and, uh, and, and I really like it because the way he used the wordings, you know, it's more as you find it in like epic video games mm -hmm. or uh, also like epic novels like Hype, uh, Hype Hyperion by Dan Simmons, you yes. know, this kind of wording. And, um, and this is not so typical for the power metal genre. Mm -hmm. We wanted to avoid this kind of cliché hammerfall, you know, fire, desire <laughs> rhymes. We, no, it's not really what we're about. Yes. And then, uh, so on the, on the new album, most of it is actually built lyrics. Yeah. Cool, awesome. Yeah. Now I want to talk to you about your influences. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things that I'm always interested in, mm -hmm. in some players. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you've mentioned in the beginning that you've played a lot of ACDC stuff mm -hmm. and then got into Petrucci Dream Theater, Symphony yeah. X. And what, what, what influences do you also have back in the day? Mm -hmm. As, Actually, quite a difficult question because mm -hmm. I, I I like so much different music and you know? mm -hmm. I went through so many different stages in my playing and I still like and enjoy all of that. So, um, I mean, very important for me and was and will, always will be and is since since my my youth is um, the entire like um, Shredder Records guitar players. I mean, basically almost all of them. You know, mm -hmm. since, since I'm 14 or 15, I'm collecting those albums mm -hmm. and I analyze the styles of, of, of most of them, you know, I spent a lot of time, uh, of course, a lot of the RAH videos that mm -hmm. those guys did back then, so, I mean, of course, I mentioned Ingui and Paul Gilbert in the beginning, but also very important for me was uh, Richie Kotzen, mm -hmm. the Rock Chops video. Yes. Uh, I, I don't even play that much like that anymore, but but uh, the, the approach, you know, was, was very, influenced me to a very mm -hmm. large degree, you know, the mm -hmm. approach to how to um, subdivide all those lines in, in a three octave uh, approach on the fretboard, so. Mm -hmm. Richie Kotzen is very, especially the early stuff, very important for me. Uh, Marty Friedman was a big name. Then of course I got into Jason Becker from there. I developed, uh, uh, sorry, I discovered Greg Howe from um, through Richie Kotzen. You know, mm -hmm. then Greg Howe became my favorite guitar player for a very long time. 
And so the entire Schreppner branch, you know, I, I saw Tony McAlpine in 1997 Ooh. at the Musik in Frankfurt. Nice. It was the first time I heard his music, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, probably still my favorite musician of all time. Not only for the guitar playing, but mm -hmm. um, the songwriting, you know, and uh, the, the melodic sensitivity. Yes. Yes. So these, these, this entire group of, of players, you know, mm -hmm. Michael Furkin, Simon, you know, all of those guys. Yes. They're um, very, very important for, for me and always will be, you know. Mm -hmm. So some other guys from that same time period who are not on the Shrapnel label, I'm a big fan of George Lynch, you mm -hmm. know. Um, probably forgetting a lot of them now, yes. because there have just been so many. But, yes. but that, I mean, that covers a little bit the, the, that, that kind, kind of, of style. Yeah, that kind of style. Later. But then, of course, I mean, when I went to the MGI, I um, no, I had a lot, a lot of chess stuff. That's when I got into, I never really got into the, to, 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 to love a clean guitar, you know, yes. that much to that degree. But then, I mean, I got into the fusion players. Mm -hmm. And then when I heard Alan Holtzworth for the first time, this is my, my entire world changed, you mm -hmm. know, the entire approach to the instrument. So even though I'm, I'm far from the way he plays, but there's an influence there, you mm -hmm. know, a little bit of an, it, inf it doesn't have to mean it influences you in a way that you play exactly the lines mm -hmm. like those people, but maybe I, I want to achieve the same fluency, you know, yes. and then develop my own way of, of playing mm -hmm. things to sound like that, you know. Get, I got into the more harmonically complex yes. layers, so mm -hmm. there was Alan Holdsworth, um, Scott Henderson mm -hmm. uh, was, was very important for me. And I got into a lot of 70s fusion players as well, like Larry Carlton, mm -hmm. for example, you know, um, his, some of his approaches to, to to have a place over, uh, over chords, you know, they, they, they really stuck with me. So I got into those guys. And then there's the entire different world, you know, of, of rhythm players, you know, in, mm -hmm. in metal. I mean, yes. I, I don't really know if, I, if there's any other players I know who have the same weird influences mix. But then there's, of course, you know, I can I can enjoy Larry Carlton just as mm -hmm. much as I enjoy listening to Running Wild, you know, yes. for example, yes. the rhythm guitar in that, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's really something that it's, it's it's also, you know, something that really, really influenced me and impressed me. Mm -hmm. the different rhythm players, you know, mm -hmm. players like, like Rolf from from Running Wild, Jeff Waters from Annihilator, yes. you know, um, um, the really tight mm -hmm. uh, uh, rhythm playing, and and I mean, there's there's a million, a million players, but I think none have influences from all of these different mm -hmm. kind of uh, genres. So that's as far as guitar players go, yes. of course. Um, I mean, I like classical stuff, you know, I'm a big fan of Johann Sebastian Bach, the entire Baroque era, you know, it influences me in a way that the way I write chord progressions, mm -hmm. for example. And I think that um, everything that you, uh, that, that you listen to influences you in a way mm -hmm. as a musician. Everything leaves a mark. It doesn't yes. necessarily have to mean you really study the player yes. in depth and learn yes. all the, the licks and get his entire mm -hmm. discography. Everything that you learn, in, uh, that you listen to leaves, uh, leaves, leaves a mark you know, yes. to a certain yes. degree. That's true. That's true. But I think I covered like a couple of the different different ones. That, mm -hmm. uh, different. What was important to me to cover the different um, styles, basically, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and the different reasons I like guitar players. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's not that I just like one thing and this is mm -hmm. exactly what I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and probably there have been some, some death metal guitar players as well, you know, that, that, that influenced me when I, when I was in, in the field of sanity, you know, when I got into all those, those bands like Monstrosity and Disincarnate, you know, James Murphy. There's always, yes. you know, there's, mm -hmm. a, there's, a, there's a, a Mike Romeo, of course, was an important mm -hmm. name for me from Symphony X. Um, there's a big, um, big list of players and it's endless and it's probably it's, it's going to keep growing as mm -hmm. long as I play and learn. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, great. So now I want to talk to you um, about your focal dystonia. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, go ahead. Let's let's. Well, it's a it's a neurological disorder mm -hmm. that I have in my uh, fretting hand. It's actually not really a disorder in the fretting hand. It's a disorder that happens uh, in the brain. The way things are are wrongly mapped there, but it manifests in my fretting hand. Mm -hmm. um, the, the causes. I mean, there are different theories about it, but what actually happens is. That whenever my index finger puts pressure on the string, the um, the flexor muscles from the middle finger are triggered mm -hmm. and it curls back into the palm of my hand. Mm -hmm. So of course it makes it very difficult to play like Paul Gilbert style string, yes. string scales and stuff like that. Um, I think I have it since at least ten years, maybe longer. I got diagnosed in 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 2011 when I definitely noticed something is wrong. And I mm -hmm. always thought I practiced too little, so I practiced more and more and more and the more I practiced, the worse. Mm -hmm. The word it got until I noticed, okay, there's definitely something not right anymore, right? And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm taking therapy classes, I'm getting Botox injections in frequent intervals, which kind of limit the flexing, or that I get 90% back mm -hmm. with a good injection of the control that I once um, used to have. I believe it probably comes from over-practicing mm -hmm. strong habits over many, many, many years, you know? Mm -hmm. 
and that kind of manifests in a disorder at that at that point and um, yeah it forced me to, to change my style a little bit to change mm -hmm. my approach to the instrument a little bit because mm -hmm. so, certain things I used to play are physically simply impossible you know yes. and I still want to play them because mm -hmm. I still hear them in my head and my my goal is always to be able to play everything that I hear in my head so instead of just not playing those things anymore my approach was to find different ways you know of playing those things yes. and um, the, the time when it started um, I was, I mean, there's a lot of legato bass playing on, on my earlier records. I was already always into the left hand Richie Cotson mm -hmm. uh, style legato playing. And then, of course, this is when I, when, when I lost the control of my middle finger, when I started developing, developing the techniques that I tap with different mm -hmm. fingers of my right hand. Started incorporating, you know, the right hand ring fingers and pinky. Mm -hmm. um, developed the, the multi finger tapping stuff. So I would, stuff that I usually used to play with, like, for example, three fingers of the left mm -hmm. hand. And one thing of the right and now use two left hand fingers, two right hand fingers, for example. I do more position shifts, stuff that I used to play, for example, with the fingers one, three, uh, one, two, four. Mm -hmm. And I do one slide, four, for oh, example. Okay. Mm -hmm. you now I have to do a lot of stuff like that. Um, so I can still play everything that I used to mm -hmm. play, but I have to think about it better. Yes. More, you know? I can't really improvise and play on the spot mm -hmm. like that anymore because I really have to think about the way mm -hmm. I play things. A patches that I used to play with the index finger, middle finger and pinky, now I have to use the index finger, ring finger and pinky mm -hmm. for example. So I used to compensate a lot with the tapping and the multi-finger tapping stuff in the early days when it happened. But I'm really, I mean, I still want to sweep pick, you know, I still yes. want to use all that picking, so I don't want to completely get rid of that. Mm -hmm. And I really worked hard on my picking because what, what happened was I said, okay, this thing is gone, but I still have other areas of my yes. playing are not affected, so instead of just, you know, being sad about what's not there anymore and focusing on the loss, I was like, I still have mm -hmm. that weapon and that weapon you know, yes. that I can develop. And I, what really happened is that my, my, my picking got a lot better in, in, in the recent years and it's become a much bigger part yes. of, of my style. And the new tennis entry got a lot yes. more picking stuff. You can really hear that. We talked about this earlier. Yes. And um, uh, it's not exclusively anymore for mm -hmm. on, the, on, on the legato and the tapping stuff. And um, uh, it's, it's just I have to think more about the finger rings that I mm -hmm. use, you know. But one thing, uh, as much as it sucks to have that, one thing that, that actually happened to me um, that I think might, might not have happened otherwise is um, that I focused, started focusing more on the music as a whole. You know, yes. like, uh, when my hand was fully functioning, I, I used to compete you know, mm -hmm. a lot for myself with other mm -hmm. players. It was like, I have to be able to play that mm -hmm. exactly like that. Mm -hmm. I have to be able to play that Richie Cotton like, exactly the way it is on the video. I would spend a lot of time on, with that. Now I know I can't do it like that. I have to do it in my own way to mm -hmm. play the same uh, sequence of notes. And I focused a lot more, you know, things. And I noticed that music actually starts in your head. Yes. That the physical manifestation is just the last step. This is just maybe the last 20, 15 percent, maybe, mm -hmm. you know. And um, uh, so I focused a lot on, on developing my, my, my phrasing in my head, my yes. approach to harmony and theory, you know, mm -hmm. the composition, the songwriting. And, and, uh, and I focused more time on that than, than trying to do exactly what someone yes. else has done before because it's simply not possible anymore, mm -hmm. right? And then the, the way I play this is my way of playing it. And I don't know if I had written that many albums, actually, if, if, if it hadn't happened. Maybe I would have been more the, the typical yes. guitar player, you know, who yes. plays session jobs, for example, yes. you know, plays other people's music. And uh, I, for me, it was like, well, playing 200 shows a year, playing someone else's music is not really an option anymore. Mm -hmm. So now I want to focus more, um, more on my writing and technically focus more on the things that are still there. So definitely there's a little bit of a change in, in, in style when you compare what I play nowadays and what I played mm -hmm. 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just approach things differently, but I still think that for myself, I li um, like uh, when you see, even though maybe there's a, a, a one, two, four combination that I can't mm -hmm. play anymore, but it's, it's the, in the whole package, I still think I became a better player yes. than, than I was in my previous time yes. days. Yes. So sometimes limitation can lead to progress. Definitely. And definitely. Yes. It leads to finding your own ways, yes. your own creative ways mm -hmm. around playing things. You know, and this is also something I want to in, encourage uh, my students with, that you don't have to do something exactly as someone else does. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can. It can be good in the, in the learning process, you know, mm -hmm. but um, the, the guitar is an instrument that can be, very, can be played very individually. Yes. And uh, when we think, when you think of the, the big names in, mm -hmm. in guitar, you know all the all the, the players that we look up to, that we like, they, they many of them have a very unique thing that they do. They're not not necessarily the most. Some of them are, but they're not always the most technically proficient yes. or well-rounded. But mm -hmm. they 
they bring something very unique yes. um, um, to the table that's, that's totally their own thing. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe sometimes it happened either because they were limited in a specific way, maybe it happened because um, they didn't know how to do certain things mm -hmm. and, and they developed out of a a little bit of a naive approach, you yes. know, to, 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 to things and, and I it can get lost quickly, you know, in, in, in modern days with YouTube videos and stuff mm -hmm. and um, that's why I like to encourage students, you yes. know, to, to, to see this just as a tool that you need to, to get across what's happening in your mind. Yes. Basically. Cool. Um, so now one question. Um, when you have to choose three records, mm -hmm. you would recommend every shred guitar beginners, which are your kind of secret three records mm -hmm. that really influenced you, yeah. which one would you choose? Well, that's a very difficult question because I have a huge collection mm -hmm. of, of, of guitar records and I love so many of them and I, I don't think I could live without any yeah. of them at this point. But um, something that, something, things that really, really stuck with me and uh, really would I, would I consider my, my Bibles of, of, mm -hmm. of sick guitar links, you know, of things that inspire me the way I want to do things. Um, I would definitely say Street Lethal by Razor X. Yes. To be record because it's so the dynamics in Paul Gilbert's playing that there's so many crazy licks in there. Mm -hmm. to, to, but not only that it's like like fast and flashy, but the way you no know, he, he he uses the dynamics in his playing. Uh, it's just for me this is the ultimate benchmark, you know, mm -hmm. for, for guitar technique. Mm -hmm. For me this is the no matter what new shredders come along, you know, this will always this will be for me forever unsurpassed. Yes. The unsurpassed uh, top level of, of of, of technicality, at least when it comes to, to rock and metal guitar mm -hmm. playing. I think no one will ever top what Paul Gilbert did on that yes. first record. He was yes. only 19 years old. I mean, yes. It's absolutely it's amazing. amazing. And it's always like for, for the picking for everything. And that's the way where I think this is the way I want it to sound. Mm -hmm. you know? This is always what I compare it to. Mm -hmm. If it sounds like that, yes. or it sounds close to that, then, yes. then it's definitely cool. You know? uh, another record that was very, very important for me was uh, Maximum Security From by Tony McAlpine. <laughs> Of course, he has the total perfect command mm -hmm. over all the different rock guitar playing techniques. You know, the sweep picking, the tap, tapping, the alternate picking, the legato playing, mm -hmm. the whammy bar vibrato, you know, all of that. But there's also um, a huge melodic sensitivity. Yes. Yeah, his approach to songwriting, you know, that you really can write really, really musical songs. Mm -hmm. And it's yes. not just a showcase of, of, mm -hmm. of, of fast and flashy licks. I mean, th this album, it, it creates an entire atmosphere. I can still listen to it, if, you know, I listen to it at least once a week, probably yes. still. Oh, really? Yeah, even after 22 years after discovering it for the first time. And it's just like, okay, you know, that, that's what I noticed, okay, you can use that stuff to actually make music with it. Mm -hmm. you know, not only to, to show what you can do, but really, you know, write actual songs. Yes. And where you where you use this as a tool. Mm -hmm. to, it, for me, it was almost like when I had that, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a modern day classical musician, yes. basically, right? Like a, like a that's what, 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 what the classical composers would have done if they had electricity and had a rock band you <laughs> yes. know, available, they probably would do something yes. like that. And then another record, and this is probably not a very well-known one, because I always notice when I talk to people about it, not many to know it. Uh, the guitar player on the album is Greg Howe, mm -hmm. but it's a solo record by a keyboard player. Yes. His name is Vitaly Kubrich. Mm -hmm. It's a, a keyboard player from the Ukraine, I think. Mm -hmm. And that was his first solo record in 1997. And Greg Howe plays all the guitars on it. But, and, and Greg Howe, we know him more as a, you know, this, this rock fusion guy, mm -hmm. and funky stuff. But High Definition is a neoclassical metal record. Oh. It's uh, songs written by a keyboard player. Yes. So all the passages on there, they were written on the keyboard, so yes. not, not on the guitar. And, and, and Greg Howe actually comes from a different genre, you know, mm -hmm. and found his own way to, to play those lines. And he played it in a very different, very individual way, very differently from what other neoclassical players okay. do, you know. He used a lot of like his typical, um, his, his two-handed tapping, mm -hmm. you know, his hammer-ons and pull offs the, 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 the left-hand hammer-ons, you know, and it's a very different approach to it, you know, mm -hmm. he plays, it's, so, so there comes the fusion guitar player and that's one of the uh, best neoclassical metal records of all time and the way he plays on that album, you know, I transcribed a lot of it and, and this is something that influenced my approach to mm -hmm. guitar technique mm -hmm. a lot more than, than, than more well-known records, yes. you know, I mean, most people would probably say something like, Perpetual Burner, Rising Force, which are also records mm -hmm. that I really like. But um, Greg's approach on that record is something that really stuck with me to the way I approach the instrument. Right. Because I think he also came a little bit from where, where he said, you know, it, it's not my main genre. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really, I didn't really um, develop the technique that most other players do, mm -hmm. so I do it in my own way, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and that really, it can really be heard on that record. And this is something that uh, definitely influenced yes. me very much. Yes. 
have to check out this record. Yeah, yeah definitely. definitely. If you don't know it, definitely, definitely check it out. Yes, we have recommend to check everyone out. to check yes. it out. Yeah. Great. Okay, now I want to talk with you about your sound, but not mm -hmm. the gear sound, the mm -hmm. sound from your fingers and from your ideas. So mm -hmm. your approach on soloing and solo writing. Yeah. Are you more the um, jamming over a backing track and see what happens guy, or do you really compose and have a vision of a solo? What's your approach on this? Actually, it's uh, none of the two really, you know. Oh. I mean, I'm, um, I would like to be able to just jam over something and then end up with the, yes. the, the, the most amazing solo. But I don't also, also don't compose them. I mean, when a song mm -hmm. is written, it's finished, I'm recording it, I don't know what's going to happen in the solo, mm -hmm. you know. So I play over it mm -hmm. as I go along. So so it's in a way you can kind of say it's like improvisation in a in a slow motion sense. You okay. know, like I don't just jam over the entire thing and the solo ends up the way mm -hmm. it is, but I try different ideas mm -hmm. on the recording, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the moment. Because I also my phrasing has to do with what happened what is happening on the drums, you know. Yes. Uh, what is happening in the other instruments? Mm -hmm. That's why I, I don't really like composing a guitar solo because okay. it ends up sounding quite stiff. What often happens is I come up with something, people find it's quite iconic and they want me to do the same thing live and I learn it and I play the same thing live. Mm -hmm. But it's a more of a... Um, I play over it several times, keep the best ideas and then I replay them. You know, yes. where it's everything clean and it's everything the, 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 the way I want it to be. But I, I think it really has to do it with the real instrument and you have to... You know, sit back and listen to what you actually mm -hmm. played, you know, and mm -hmm. then figure out about it, what's good, mm -hmm. what's bad, you know, and so it's actually a mix of the a mix of the two. It's, it almost never happens that I record a song and I already know what's going to happen. Okay. So the only things that we compose is, for example, in turn is and the harmony, yes. of course, because mm -hmm. you have to compose them and you have two yes. guitar players doing the stuff. And these we write out in Guitar Pro, mm -hmm. and one guy starts recording, the other guy has to, you know, mm -hmm. play along to it. Mm -hmm. um, but in my individual solos, I always take this kind of slow motion mm -hmm. improvisation okay. approach, you know. Great. And I take taking the best ideas and then replaying it yes. when I know, okay, that's that's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when it comes to the harmony and to the mm -hmm. kind of scale approach, mm -hmm. I see there are some different camps. Some people are thinking more in intervals, arpeggios, mm -hmm. and the harmony context. Some people are um, thinking more in scales. Mm -hmm. Where would you find your kind of play, or what would what approach do you like the most? I, I have um, more the intervallic approach. Mm -hmm. It depends a lot on the situation, but um, this is really something I do no, no matter the context I'm playing in. I mean, of course, everything you play is, is a, a kind of a scale. Yeah, but I don't yes. think of a scale as a fretboard. Yes. Pattern. For me, a scale mm -hmm. is a set of intervals. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I see them on the fretboard. You know, mm -hmm. I don't. I don't. I mean, probably of course. You know, I play a three note per string run, then it's definitely going to end up being that scale position. Yes. But I don't really use them, I don't really think like that. You know, yes. I think for me a, a scale, a tonality, it's a set of intervals. Mm -hmm. And I think of a scale not in a linear way, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Mm -hmm. I think more in a way that jazz players think. Um, and I also figure that generally piano players think more like that. I stack a scale as a big chord, you know. Yes. Like, so for example, a Lydian uh, scale for me is like a a major Just seven nine sharp eleven thirteen mm -hmm. chord. So you see it in see it in thirds. Mm -hmm. You see instantly what arpeggios are included, and I like to use this kind of upper structure theory mm -hmm. approach that I don't necessarily play arpeggios from the root note. Yes, from a higher degree in the mm -hmm. scale. So I target the more exciting intervals. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is a concept that we know from jazz playing, yes. and fusion playing. Um, because rock players like Steve Vai started applying it as well. But mm -hmm. you can, the interesting thing is, it even works in a simple harmonic context. Mm -hmm. you know, even when I play in a power metal band and you have a very simple Iron Maiden type uh, chord progression, you know, yes. the A minor, F major, G mm -hmm. major. And over the F major, you have the Lydian function, and then I will yes. play a C major 7 arpeggio on top yeah. of it. To get to the sharp in, Exactly, right? So this is actually the way that I think. So I, I practiced that a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the beginning, it was very focused on that, you know, and now it's more like it's, it's become second nature to yes. me. I play lines that are a combination, where I often like to play lines that are a combination of different musical information. Mm -hmm. Where it's not just an arpeggio or a fast scale, mm -hmm. but it's a lot of musical information going on in the same lick. And uh, I, I, that's the, the, the way I like to think, I try to think. So very often I would also practice a scale on the guitar, n not in a linear way, but going in fifths, for example. Yes. You know, uh, and, 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 and subdividing all kinds of things like that. And, and of course, often people ask, what are the scales you yes. most commonly use? And mm -hmm. I think the most simple answer would be it's actually the major scale yes. and it's whatever um, modes are yes. according to the chord progression, mm -hmm. right? But of course I also spend a lot of time with, um, of course you play neoclassical metal, it's going to be mostly modes of the major scale and mm -hmm. the harmonic minor scale. Yes. 
and that's what what's happening in Eternity's End or when I do uh, my solo records sometimes, you know. But I also know a lot about, you know, melodic minor, harmonic major, mm -hmm. all the modes of those. And there are situations where I actually use them. Usually, um, the more fusiony tracks on my mm -hmm. solo records, the more progressive stuff. It happens, for example, sometimes in Alkaloid, you know, that Hannes writes songs. He's not a he doesn't know a lot of theory, but mm -hmm. he's a good guitar player. He writes by ear. He yeah. writes a certain set of intervals, and sometimes things actually yes. end up being a mode of the harmonic major. Oh, really? really? Would, I mean, really? he wouldn't know, right? But, yeah. but and I have to play solo with it, so I see, okay, what's the set of intervals? Yeah. What's the root note? I write down, like, okay, that's that, you know. And yeah. then I have, of course, I have that knowledge of scales. Yes. And sometimes, when there's a chance, you know, I like to break out of um, playing the most obvious things. Mm -hmm. But you have to have the harmonic context. I figured the less is happening, the, the, the less notes you have, the more freedom you have. Mm -hmm. Play over it, right? Yes. So uh, sometimes I like to use half whole diminished scales. You mm -hmm. know, I like even some that as two or three situations in my in my recording discography where I used the Messian mode number three, oh. like the scale that Alan Holdsworth used, yes. and I got into yes. symmetrical scales more mm -hmm. or less by accident mm -hmm. when I recorded for the Spawn of Possession album, mm -hmm. and the riffs were written almost chromatically, right? Yes. And I, but I approached it from a very schooled approach. It was like, what you know, what it has to fit scale. for me that the, the riff is like a chord. Then that's mm -hmm. the, that's the, that's the Note family, yes, and the, and the, and the, and this chord, even though it's played a separate note, yes. right, has to be included in the scale that I use. And back then I didn't know about Messiah modes or something, mm -hmm. but I figured there was a symmetry. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a symmetry in the in the in, in, in the riffing, and then, then I filled it up logically. Yes, and then I used it, and later on someone told me, you know, what you used there, this is the Messiah mm -hmm. note number three, right? Mm -hmm. And then on my next solo record, Beyond the Wall of Sleep, on the title track, I used it on purpose. Then I figured out, okay, how can this be yes. used on chords? And I figured, okay, this gives you the Alan Holdsworth type yes. of sound, you know? Yes. So sometimes sometimes I actually do that as well. And then, and then But it's not really that I see a scale pattern mm -hmm. on the guitar, no. It's just a set of intervals, and then I think, what are patches are included there? How mm -hmm. can I combine mm -hmm. them? And how can I create uh, interesting lines from that? Yeah, so I'm uh, exclusively playing Ibanez guitars basically since 1995, as long as I can, almost as long as I play. Um, my favorite guitar is actually still this one. That's uh, my, my gem. This is being built in uh, 1991. I got it in 95, like one of my first guitars. And I still use it in everything that I play in standard tuning, right? So all of my instrumental tunes that are in standard tuning, I still use this guitar. Um, it, it has a couple of damages because I took it on the road a lot, but I don't take it on the road anymore. You know, it's too valuable for me at this point, so I just play it at home. Um, yeah, then I play Archies. When I in a six-string situation, we return down a whole step, as in uh, Eternity's End. We tune to D standard. And my main guitars in that band are actually those two. And then in Alkaloid, I have to play seven strings. You know, a lot of the material is written for seven-string guitars. We have them in. Uh, a standard tuning, and I use this um, RGD7 Prestige or this Ivanus Universe. Okay, as far as strings are concerned, I play DR strings. I use different gauges for different tunings. Uh, for D standard, I'm using 10 to 46, and for E standard, I'm using 9 to 42. And a cool thing about these DR strings is that they feel very fresh even after a longer time on the guitar. You know, they don't feel worn out too quickly and they still maintain that fresh sound for quite a while. Okay, so much for that. Thank you for uh, making the special episode. Mm -hmm. uh, the person himself, Christian Münzner, here on the Shred ABC. Mm -hmm. What's, uh, it was a really good time, really great information from you and yeah. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Yes, I think it's a really great format and I'm uh, looking forward to see more of it. Yeah, so then goodbye and cheers. <laughs>